I've made it no small secret that I hate the best of Pokemon Adventures Yellow, and you're probably wondering why. Well, it's a complete bastardization of the entire Yellow arc, for starters! Much like the best of Pokemon Adventures Red, this is an abridged version, which consists of severely compressing four volumes, or rather, three volumes because they don't have a single panel from Volume 6 in here. This results in them removing the vast majority of the plot, reducing anyone but Yellow, Lorelei, Bill, and Lance into small cameos, followed by cherry-picking the few standalone rounds that are in the Yellow arc, and then placing them in a 200-page book. What could possibly go wrong? Well, it started to go wrong in the best of Pokemon Adventures Red. As you know, Yellow was introduced in the Red, Green, and Blue story arc just before the end. Since it would require something resembling actual knowledge about the series or giving a damn, they skipped over Yellow's introduction. And from there, it only gets worse. The biggest problem is you really can't abridge the Yellow story arc. Their attempt isn't exactly helped by constantly referencing events that aren't in the book. One thing that suffers greatly from the compression is Yellow's character development. Yellow starts off as a pacifist, but has to quickly accept the reality that she has to fight. In the end, she still resents fighting, but does it because of the necessity to protect people and Pokémon. Finally, this book isn't composed of the best of Yellow. There are only two rounds separating the start of the story arc with the final battle. It keeps the fact that Yellow is a girl a secret, and it doesn't have the round where Surt is sent fleeing in terror. And I don't care if it wasn't in this story arc, it was Yellow's second greatest moment in the entire series. The first, of course, being the fight against Lance. Oh, and it includes Pidgeotto Pick Me Up. On the subject of Surd, Volume 38 featured a flashback to the downer ending of the Fire Red and Leaf Green story arc. The problem is, if my calculations are correct, and by calculations I mean basic math, if Fizz continues to go at their current rate of one volume every two months for the first 29 volumes, and one volume every three months for Pokemon Adventures Diamond, Pearl, and Platinum, they will effectively spoil the ending of the Fire Red and Leaf Green story arc five months before they release that volume and who Surt is 14 months before Volume 29 is released. That's incredibly smooth and well thought out, Viz. Of course, that's assuming that they get past the Ruby and Sapphire story arc with all of its child abuse and several main characters dying. Back to Pidgeotto Pick Me Up. For those of you who don't remember why I called this the worst moment in the entire Pokemon franchise, here's a small refresher for what's wrong with it. Every last speck! Everything! EVERYTHING! People, children, animals, towns and houses and everything! 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 In a shocking twist, this book actually makes it bearable. Since they removed all of the context before and after it, including one of the most important moments in the entire story arc, we're left with a short, mediocre standalone round. It's just bearable. This round is done much better in Volume 9, where the reasons why Gold wasn't looking over the egg weren't completely brain-dead. Also, it's actually funny, and it subverts Togepi's normal defenseless baby persona brought on by the anime. It's Pidgeotto pick-me-up done right. Other rounds that they saw fit to include into this best-of collection was the rounds where Lorelei let Yellow waltz away. Once again, Yellow and Bill's feet are frozen to the ice raft that they are using to get away. At this point, neither the reader or Lorelai even knows that Bill has a Pokémon, let alone a fire Pokémon. After Green fled, Lorelai could have simply followed them. If she lost them in the river and they had used Vulpix to melt the ice raft or at least free themselves, then send the ice raft downstream, and then hide in the forest, this would have at least been acceptable. But she just lets the one Pokémon that knows how to stop the Elite Four's evil plan and a trainer who can read the thoughts of Pokémon escape without bothering to do anything. I realize this would violate a rule on the evil overlord list, but Lorelai, if I was in charge of the Elite Four, you would be vaporized! And then she goes and blames Green when she was fully intent on letting Yellow walk away, when she let Yellow escape, when she couldn't be bothered to break a sweat trying to catch up to a people who are at the complete mercy of the current of the river. Lorelai, you are a dumbass! Looking at this again, it seems the only reason the Elite Four lost wasn't because of the Pokédex holders interfering, but rather because the members of the Elite Four were ungodly incompetent and insanely stupid. Lorelai I've wasted enough time talking about, Bruno had to be brainwashed to actually do stuff, Lance doesn't even use the full extent of his powers, and by his hesitation to kill anyone in Vermilion City, I don't think he fully believes in what they're doing. And once again, that was actually in the original Japanese version, and that wasn't Viz's censorship. Shocking, I know. Agatha gives up for no reason, despite having a giant tactical advantage, and she actually is the only member who seems to do anything. 
Having gotten the badges, controlling the Pokémon, attacking the mainland in search of the final gym badge, finally their goal of creating a utopia for Pokémon could have easily been achieved by creating a Pokémon reserve. Of course, that would require actual effort and motivation, something which every member but Agatha is lacking, and she will be on her deathbed soon enough. And if they had gone about it that way, we wouldn't have a story. Even though it's not included in this book, I wanted to touch up on the rounds where Lance vaporized Vermilion City. If this was some other big bad showing off his power, it probably would have been intimidating. And if the city was populated, it would have cemented him as a someone with no regards to human life. However, since the city was abandoned and it's Lance, it's stupid. I had several reasons why this bugged me in my Volume 5 review. A recap. Number one, it took him at least nine days to get to Vermilion City, leading me to believe that he intentionally waited for the surfing competition. Number two, the person he went to Vermilion City to find was no longer there because he took so long. He acts dumbfounded that this would be the case. Number three, he vaporizes an abandoned city despite his goals being to kill humanity anyways. Number four, what was shown at the bleachers at the surfing competition didn't emphasize that the city was abandoned. Of course, since I'm a complete idiot, I missed the two biggest reasons as to why this is stupid. The fifth, and perhaps the most important reason why this is absurdly stupid is because... All those people who were supposedly at the surfing competition are now homeless. Their homes need to be rebuilt, and Pokémon's habitats are going to be destroyed either by getting the necessary materials required to build the houses, or clearing forests and marshlands for new homes. Lance, you've clearly thought this one through. The sixth reason. With the marginal chance that Giovanni decided to stay in the city for a Tim Hortons coffee or something, why would you vaporize the city? Lance needed the final badge to summon and control Lugia. If your attack vaporized buildings, what makes you think that a small piece of magical metal could survive when nothing else could? Unfortunately, as Lance has proved, a good portion of this story arc requires everyone being brain dead. So, the last six rounds of this book is the fight against Lance. They, however, cut out the first part, reducing Mewtwo to a small three-panel cameo. This is just depressing. Mewtwo was shafted in both this and the best of Pokémon Adventures Red. So far, he has only had three battles in the entire series, however, each of them have been memorable and some of the best moments in the entire series. Also, I really love the panel stating what Lance's additional powers are, and that he only has to use the first two powers for normal opponents. This requires that the reader forgets his introduction was basically this. <laughs> Fear my evil gloating! I'm flying while controlling the weather, and I can also control hyper beams, all in the span of seven panels. Humans must be destroyed! Fear fizzes censorship! Yep, in the span of seven panels on page 136 and 137 of Volume 5, he used all four powers against Yellow. The ability to fly, the ability to control the weather, controlling hyperbeams, and multitasking. If you thought that the censorship was completely unnecessary and stupid, here comes the best of Pokémon Adventures Yellow to prove that you're right. Look, when the villain's main goals in the second story arc revolve around killing every single human on Earth, I think common sense would dictate that the last thing you would censor would be death. For those wondering why I'm harsh on the censorship, there are multiple reasons. The first and the most important reason is that none of this was censored in their first release, and consequently the releases of the best of Pokémon Adventures Red and Yellow, which once again has the same age rating as their second translation. In the same vein, the Legend of Zelda manga also has the same age rating, and keeps the references to death intact. At first, I thought that this was because in a series where this happens, it would be incredibly stupid to censor death. This brings us to our second reason. Death has always been in the Pokémon franchise. To make a long story short, I'll just quickly cover one from the first game. Ignoring everything else in Pokémon Tower, we have the ghost of Marowak. A Marowak that was killed by Team Rocket while trying to protect its child, a Cubone. The third reason, the censorship is so inconsistent. For example, in Volume 1, it's made clear that Koga intends to kill Blue and Red, even using the word die. However, when they fight back in self-defense and decapitate the Arbok, this had to be censored with Blue reassuring the readers that it was a zombie Pokémon he cut through, despite not looking like any other zombie Pokémon. Also, there is a lot of content in this series which I would consider worse than simply saying die. At the current moment, I feel that the only people who know why this is censored is Viz. So I guess I'll have to ask them myself. Finishing this review, they cut out the epilogue. They end the story at Yellow's Dreams. My guess is they only had 200 pages to work with. As it stands, I cannot recommend the best of Pokémon Adventures Red or Yellow. The first seven volumes are out, making them incredibly pointless. Back in 2006, they might have served a purpose. But now I don't even know why they're still on store shelves. These don't even work that well as an introduction to the series. I'd rather recommend volumes 1 or 3 for that. 
If the censorship bothers you enough and you still want to support the authors, it's probably better importing from Singapore. It's bloody expensive, but it will at least send a message to Viz that their completely inconsistent, self-imposed, nonsensical censorship is unacceptable and you won't accept that crap. The best of Pokemon Adventures Red and the best of Pokemon Adventures Yellow. You were both giant wastes of money and I regret buying you. Goodbye. <laughs>